Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about RNA, ribonucleic acid. And in particular, I want to get into a discussion with you about non-coding RNA. That's right, non-coding RNA is fascinating because you might, you might think, for example, non-coding RNA might include things like ribosomal RNA or transfer RNA. When I say non-coding, I mean non-coding for uh, for protein. In other words, messenger RNA is a coding uh, transcript for the production of a polypeptide. But this particular discussion that I'm going to have with you right now is not about transfer RNA or ribosomal RNA, but rather it's a class of non-coding RNAs that are extraordinary. There are small pieces of RNA that are micro RNA and small interfering RNA. And those two particular types of RNA play in a very important role in gene regulation by silencing messenger RNA and therefore affecting protein synthesis and therefore affecting uh, development of cells and all sorts of very important things. And so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but just a little background on this that um, some of our understanding of uh, these small interfering RNAs or these non-coding RNAs came from the, the study of this nematode worm known as C. elegans. And we were wondering about, always we're wondering about how cells develop in the birth of new cell types or cell differentiation or how do cells specialize. And so a lot of research was done in, in terms of looking at variants in the lineage of how some mutant C. elegans were able to develop certain cell types and others were not. And that led to the discover of the discovery of these micro RNAs. It's a real cool story. I, uh, this video isn't about that, but if you wanted to investigate this, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, a little bit more about it though. So Andrew Fire and, and Craig Mello share the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2006 for their paper in 1998 that they wrote about uh, RNA interference in the in the nematode worm C. elegans, as I was mentioning before. So it's pretty fascinating. So a little background about uh, about the DNA and in terms about the human genome. We we use the term genome to represent all three billion base pairs of a, of a human. But if you want to want to throw out another term, how about this one? Exome. The human exome, as you can see here, is just the the, the genes that are being expressed into proteins. And so this number has been fluctuating uh, since I've been studying biology for a few years. Um, but we basically think we have it down to about 22,550 different protein coding genes. To me, that doesn't seem like a lot. <laughs> That's not a lot of genes uh, to make up you know, the complexity of, human, of a human. And, and what, even more rem remarkable than that, that only a small fraction of the DNA actually codes for protein. So, and then of the, of the proteins, what, what, you know, what are these proteins? Well, I can't name them all right here, but about half of them are enzymes, and you, and you would probably guess that. Those are so important in regulating met metabolism. And, and the others are various structure as well, and also, of course, um, antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. But the genome sequencing recently, next-gen sequencing, has revealed that protein coding DNA accounts for only 1.5% of the human genome. And so what, what, is, what is going on? And so there's a small fraction of non-coding uh, DNA as well. In other words, uh, the RNA that is producing transfer RNA that carries ribosomes to the, to the ribosome, and actually the structural RNA that makes up a ribosome itself, ribosomal RNA. So until recently, um, DNA was assumed uh, that that part was not, not being transcribed. But more recently, in 2012, a study showed that 75% of the genome is transcribed. So what's going on? If, if RNA is being produced and it's not, uh, messenger RNA, and it's and it's not just transfer RNA, and it's not just ribosomal RNA. Then what is this other RNA? 
And so we call that other RNA non-coding RNA. And the non-coding RNA, now this is in, a, in addition to the, the ribosomal and transfer, this other non-coding RNA plays in very critical multiple roles in gene expression. And so how does it do that? Well, it regulates whether or not a protein is being made or not being made. And it, and it does this largely by silencing messenger RNA. And so these small non-coding RNAs are the focus of this particular conversation that we're having in this video because the, these small pieces of microRNA, as they're referred to, as they're small, are capable of binding complementary to the sequences of messenger RNA. And if you have two pieces of RNA interacting, it's going to interfere with the RNA's ability to, uh, to be translated briefly uh, stated. <laughs> so microRNAs are these miRNAs, are small, they're single-stranded RNAs that can bind to messenger RNA. And with the help of other proteins, there's a little animation that I'm going to show at the end of this video that which will help um, the understanding of this. But with other proteins, uh, so the small microRNAs and proteins can either degrade messenger RNA, in other words, cut it up and therefore silence it, or block its translation by binding to it complementary. And so the effects of on messenger RNA by microRNA is, is one of decreasing their activity or silencing them, okay? And so it prevents it from producing a protein. And so uh, this can be a busy diagram. I hope, it, I hope it's okay. But as it turns out, the, the RNA can, with the help of a, of a protein called dicer, uh, be uh, cut up into uh, single-stranded microRNA, and the microRNA, when associated with proteins, again, video coming hopefully soon, uh, microRNA will either attach to the messenger RNA degrading it, or it will attach to it complementary via hydrogen bonds and prevent the translation of it, but basically preventing messenger RNA from, from uh, producing a protein, therefore silencing uh, the protein production. Therefore, Ultimately, one could say it's regulating gene expression. And so this RNA pathway uh, is initiated, as I was mentioning, by this enzyme dicer, which cleaves the, the double-stranded RNA uh, that comes off the DNA into short fragments, about approximately 20 nucleotides in length. The microRNA thus is named. And then uh, it's unwound into single-stranded RNAs. And then there's uh, another class of microRNA that's very similar to microRNA, I should say, not, not a type of microRNA, but similar to microRNA, and it's called small interfering RNA, or siRNA. Now, th this little guy is pretty similar in function to, to microRNA in that it silences messenger RNA and degrades it and blocks it from being translated. But it is slightly different. It associates with different proteins a little bit, and it also has a little different uh, structure. But it's similar in size uh, and function to microRNA. So the phenomena of inhibition, in other words, inhibiting gene expression or blocking it by RNA is referred to, and this is huge, and I want to emphasize this. I think I might circle it right here. Right here is known as the field, an emerging field in biology known as RNA interference or RNAi. There's a lot of hope going on right now in biology with this uh, RNAi, RNAi interference because it disables specific genes. And if you can disable specific genes and then it affects phenotype in an organism, you would then know what that gene does or what that protein does. By blocking something, you know what happens when it normally functions, therefore. And so it leads um, us into the avenue of uh, using these small uh, microRNAs and inter small interfering RNAs. RNAs uh, we use them to determine 
uh, how cells specialize in terms of um, uh, multicellular organisms, so cellular differentiation during embryonic development. And so, you know, we know that they give rise to many different cell types. So how is it that certain genes are, are uh, being regulated and others are not, is the question. And so it's a hugely valuable tool it's, uh, in, in cell culture, living organisms, because when you can introduce fairly easily, you pipette the synthetic RNA, for example, and, and you introduce it, it can really robustly uh, suppress or silence specific genes of interest. And again, it's really valuable to be able to do that. And then, you know, we could, we could shut down certain genes and then uh, we can then identify what proteins are not being produced and then we can then deduce what are the components necessary in a normal cellular process. And so this is really important in terms of lo looking at all the proteins necessary to regulate the cell cycle as it influences cancer. And then more importantly, uh, maybe not more importantly than, than uh, cancer, but equally as important as, as cancer, is that we might be able to use the, the, the RNA as a therapy. In other words, if we can figure out how uh, interference uh, RNA interference can maybe silence viral genes because a virus, as you may know, is uh, basically a protein with, with RNA inside of it or DNA inside of it. So maybe it could be used as a, uh, a therapeutic viral, antiviral infection uh, methodology. So pretty cool. Uh, uh, basically, again, a, a video is coming shortly, is that the the RNA is, is transcribed, and then again, it's incorporated with, with proteins, and then ultimately, it's uh, being bound to messenger RNA, or it helps to cleave uh, RNA and, and degrade it, and therefore regulate the expression of the protein. And so, uh, take a look at this. I hope the, this video doesn't disappoint. I, I've sort of foreshadowed it. Uh, and so, it's, pretty, it's particularly good. Let's check it out. Many organisms use RNAi to control genes, and it can also be used as a tool in the laboratory, and in the future, perhaps, as a therapy. Yes. This animation will introduce you to the principles of RNAi involving two important types of RNA molecule, small interfering RNAs and microRNAs. Both Eukaryotic cells have many sophisticated ways of controlling gene expression. In the complex environment of a cell, these mechanisms need to be precisely targeted. So pretty cool here, just to give you a little bearing here. These are um, part of the cytoskeleton here, these big cables right here, and these are motor proteins that are carrying vesicles around. This looks like the Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, and this blue fella in the back there with holes are, is the nucleus. And so we talk about uh, chromatin modification when we talk about gene regulation both acetylation and uh, uh, methylization. We can also talk about transcription initiation, but now we're talking about uh, small uh, RNA molecules that can interfere and silence genes. There's a group of mechanisms that use small RNA molecules to direct gene silencing. This is called RNAi. Or RNA interference. Inside the nucleus, most genes that encode proteins are transcribed by RNA polymerase II. So here's RNA the primary polymerase. RNA transcript is processed by splicing and forms a mature messenger RNA, sometimes called mRNA. Okay, so that, that uh, messenger RNA can also be processed as well, and that's another way in which genes can regulate gene expression by processing RNA. The messenger RNA is then exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Here, ribosomes catalyze translation of the messenger RNA to form polypeptide chains that fold into proteins. Right there. But this is also where some small RNA molecules can have their silencing effects. There are several types of regulatory small RNA. Small interfering RNAs, known as siRNAs, are derived from longer double-stranded RNAs that are either produced in the cell itself or are delivered into cells experimentally. 
the introduction of siRNAs okay. or double-stranded RNA is widely used to manipulate gene expression. MicroRNAs are another type of small RNA. Most microRNAs come from RNAs that are transcribed in the nucleus, which then fold and are processed before being exported into the cytoplasm as double-stranded precursor microRNAs. The double-stranded precursors of microRNAs and siRNAs bind to DICER, which is an endonuclease protein that cuts the RNA into short segments. So that's pretty neat. The, this is a, a molecule that's capable of, of cleaving the double-stranded uh, RNA, the micro double-stranded RNA into single-stranded uh, RNA. So that's that's pretty neat. But don't don't lose the point. I mean, in some ways the animation is totally awesome in terms of visualization. But we're basically talking about something kind of basic, which is that these small non-coding because they're not producing, um, they're not the messenger RNA. These non-coding small pieces of RNA are basically interfering with messenger RNA and therefore silencing the gene production. Most siRNAs and microRNAs are approximately 21 nucleotides long. So they're small. The short double-stranded RNA then binds an argonaut protein. One strand of the RNA is selected and remains bound to argonaut. This is called the guide strand. The combination of the RNA and argonaut, along with other proteins, is called the RNA-induced silencing complex, or RISC. So there's proteins... Uh, SIRNAs direct risk to bind to specific messenger RNAs. The targeting is precise because it's determined by base pairing between the SIRNA and the target messenger RNA. So that's important. So they're not just uh, silencing any gene free willy. They're particularly targeting uh, areas because they're complementary, base pair complementary uh, to the messenger RNA. SIRNAs often have perfect complementarity to their target sites. Once bound, argonaut catalyzes cleavage of the messenger RNA, which will then be degraded. So that's pretty cool. I mean, can you imagine a therapy in which the messenger RNA is not just messenger RNA, but it's viral messenger RNA. Um, and so therefore, if you can put in the silencing piece uh, of RNA in here, it'll actually start to break up viral messenger RNA and therefore slow down viral replication within the host cell as a therapy. It's, it's brilliant. MicroRNAs also guide risk to messenger RNAs. Usually only part of a microRNA, known as the seed, pairs with a target messenger RNA. This imprecise matching allows microRNAs to target hundreds of endogenous messenger RNAs. So this one's a little bit loose in terms of its... Targeting by a microRNA can lead to messenger RNAs being degraded or translation being inhibited. Argonauts and their small regulatory RNA cofactors are found in plants, animals, fungi, and some bacteria, and their importance in a multitude of biological processes and as tools continues to be revealed. Yes, <laughs> understatement of all time. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this video on uh, uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, such as microRNAs and uh, uh, small interference RNAs, uh, leading to RNA interference and silencing in general. Overall, the big umbrella being uh, gene regulation. Thanks for watching.